Thank you, everyone. Welcome to the first roundtable uh, organized by the African Space Leadership Institute. Uh, coincidentally, this is the first roundtable uh, on US-Africa Space Partnership, and we look forward to more of um, such roundtables and discussions. Uh, my name is Etimof Young. It's my honor and privilege to be the moderator uh, of this event. I want to thank the African Union and the US Embassy in Pretoria for their support towards um, this event. Thanks to His Excellency Professor Mohamed Belousin, the Commissioner responsible for Education, Science, Technology and Innovation at the African Union Commission. Thanks also to um, Ambassador Ruben Brigetti, the US Ambassador to South Africa, for the immense support and for honoring our, our invitation. Uh, we shall listen to their keynote addresses um, shortly. I also want to thank our highly esteemed stellar panelists, whom I shall introduce shortly. And of course, everyone who has taken time out to um, participate in this event. Uh, I mean, what, what I do here is really an exciting thing for me, especially knowing the fact that there are other space related activities going on in Africa right now. Um, during the introduction, um, Chidian said, um, there's Geo Week going on in Ghana right now. And in South Africa, just earlier today, the Regional Space Weather Center was launched today. So a couple of things are going on in Africa and we look forward to more things um, happening in Africa to showcase to the world and to see how we can work with partners globally towards space development in Africa. Before we go on, let me just say a little bit about the African Space Leadership Institute, uh, ASLI as we call it. Uh, ASLI is Africa's first think tank that is focused on space policy, strategy, law, governance, and related issues. The institute was established earlier this year in July, though the official launch was uh, on October 4, um, just last month. And some of us that, were he that are here right now were present at that um, launch event. The objectives of the institute are majorly one, to develop Africa's capacity and capabilities in space policy, strategy, law, governance, diplomacy, and leadership. Secondly, to support strong positioning of African space activities so that Africa can obtain optimum benefits from space science, technology, applications, and exploration. And thirdly, to strengthen Africa's contributions to global space discourses, as well as Africa's participation in international forums. Uh, the vision is transformative in the sense that we want to see Africa that has an exceptional capacity in space policy and strategy, that has good decision-making processes, that has a strong strategic positioning, and space programs that meet the developmental needs and aspirations of Africans, of course, as well as effective participation in international forums. ASLI has planned out several programs towards achieving its objectives and vision. This includes more roundtables like this one that we are having right now, colloquia, dialogues, policy talks, training courses, webinars, publications, advisory services, and advocacy. Information about these programs will be made available on the Institute's website and of course on its social media programs. A platform, sorry. Um, I need to also say that the Institute is open to partnerships and collaborations with individuals and institutions in areas of um, mutual interest. So once again, um, I would like to welcome everybody to this um, event. Uh, and to kick off the event, we'll first of all listen to keynote addresses from um, the representatives of the African Union Commission and uh, the US Embassy. Uh, um, the commissioner for AUC is um, on a, presently on a mission. I just got to know that yesterday night, so he's not able to attend. Uh, but the director in charge of um, education, science, technology, and innovation is supposed to deliver his keynote address, but it appears he is not yet um, available. I've not seen him online yet. Mr. Marcellini, if you're online. Uh, I've not seen him online yet. So I think we may, while we, well, whenever he comes online, then 
um, we can have him deliver the commissioner's uh, address. So I think we go, we now listen to um, the, uh, the address by the US ambassador. Unfortunately, he is also not available, but he has sent a recorded um, video message, which I'm gonna play shortly. But before I do that, I just want to read uh, a brief about um, Ambassador Ruben Brigetti. Uh, Ambassador Ruben Brigetti was nominated by President Joe Biden on February 10, 2022, to be the US ambassador to the Republic of South Africa. He served as the, as the 17th Vice Chancellor of the University of the South <laughs> and the Mayor of Sewani from June 2020, 2020 until December 2021. Previously, he served as the Dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs of the George Washington University. Ambassador Brigadier's uh, most recent diplomatic assignment, that's before going to South Africa, was serving as the U.S. representative to the Africa Union and the U.S. permanent representative to the UNECA from September 2013 to September 2015. He has also served previously as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of African Affairs, and also as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration. <clears throat> Excuse me. He's a native of Jack Jacksonville in Florida. He has held appointments as an Assistant Professor of Government and Politics at George Mason University and at the School of International Service at American University between August 2003 and April 2009. In addition, Ambassador Gudetti was a researcher at the Arms Division of Human Rights Watch from August 2001 to May 2003, where he conducted research missions in Afghanistan and Iraq. Before joining the Human Rights Watch, Ambassador Gudetti was an active duty US naval officer and held several staff positions in the Pentagon and in fleet support units. Um, he is a 1995 distinguished midshipman graduate of US Naval Academy where he earned a BS in political science with merit, served as the brigade commander and received the Thomas G. Pornell Scholarship. He also holds an MPhil and a PhD in international relations from the University of Cambridge, England, as, a, as well as a doctor of humane letters, honoris causa from Old Dominion University. And Mr. Brigitte is a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a recipient of the Council's International Affairs Fellowship. He's a member of the Board of Councillors of McLarty Associates and adjoint senior fellow for African Peace and Security at the Council on Foreign Relations and a fellow of the African Acadi Academy of Diplomacy. So I'll play Ambassador Brigetti's um, uh, speech right now. Uh, so, um, so I'll just share that. Uh, sorry, Bala. Bala, kindly allow me to share, please. You should be able to share now. Okay. Go. Good afternoon from U.S. Embassy Pretoria. It is my honor to kick off the roundtable discussions on the U.S.-Africa Space Partnership. As we head into the Africa Leaders Summit next month, I am confident the honored panelists participating in this event, my friends and colleagues among them, will engage in fruitful discussions about the future of space cooperation between our two great nations. I look forward to the suggestions and proposals that will arise from these discussions. On September 12th of this year, NASA and Rice University commemorated the 60th anniversary of President John F. Kennedy's speech committing the United States to landing astronauts on the moon and returning them safely back to Earth. It was a bold commitment. Back then, there were only a pair of nations with space programs and capabilities. Sixty years later, advances in science, training and education and the ability to manufacture high technology products have greatly expanded the number of countries that are contributing to the never-ending mission of space exploration. African nations, in particular South Africa, 
have been our partners in this march to discover and use what space offers to the human race. And what does space offer us? I'll give you three examples. Security, economic growth, and fighting climate change. Consider security. The NASA Asteroid Terrestrial Impact Last Alert System, or ATLAS, telescope program, which last January discovered its first near-Earth object from a telescope in Sutherland, South Africa. Consider economic growth. The new Space Weather Center in Hermanus is providing critical information on cosmic rays and solar flares that could affect telecommunications and satellites that our economies and societies depend on for growth and development. And consider fighting climate change. The Landsat Ground Station, hosted by the South African National Space Agency, receives and distributes satellite data used by policymakers to make decisions about our precious natural resources and environment. These are just a few examples of what we're already working on with South Africa. Next week, a NASA delegation will be in South Africa for the groundbreaking ceremony of a lunar exploration ground site in the Western Cape province to help track objects transiting from Earth to the moon and back as part of the Artemis mission. This U.S.-South Africa collaboration marks the beginning of a new era we hope will expand throughout the African continent. Let's ensure all Africans benefit from the fruit of our collective labors in space. Space belongs to us all. And I'd like to say just thank you, but I can't help but add, live long and prosper. That was the U.S. Ambassador to South Africa. Um, thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, I think I, I, I think I noticed Mr. Marshallini. I'm not. I thought I saw him come up. Mr. Marshallini, are you? Mr. Marshallini. Uh, yes, can hear you. Tim, you have a problem with connection. Oh, okay. Uh, I can hear you now. So having listened to... Having listened to the, your, the keynote address by the U.S. Ambassador, we will now listen to the keynote address by the Commissioner for Human Resource... Sorry, that was, that was the former name, I'm sorry. The Commissioner for Education, Science, Technology, and Innovation. Uh, like I said earlier, he's a presently on a mission, so his address will be delivered by the director uh, responsible for that department. But before he comes up, I'll just read um, a little, a brief bio about um, His Excellency the Commissioner. Uh, Professor Mohamed Belosin, an Algerian national, held various faculty positions at the University of Algiers, as well as at the Algerian Ministry of Health before joining the International Civil Service in 1997. He's the former director of the Division for, of Non-Communicable Diseases at the World Health Organization Regional Office for Africa. He served in various capacities and stations, including Zimbabwe, Republic of Congo, Nigeria, Tanzania, and Guinea. He ended his career as um, UN System Coordinator and UNDP that's the United Nations Development Program President Representative in Tunisia from 2009 to 2013. In October 2021, supported by his country, he was elected to the position of Commissioner for Education, Science, Technology, and Innovation within the African Union. So, uh, Mr. Marcellini, you have the floor now, please. Thank you. Thank you very much moderator good afternoon to you uh i hope you hear me clear and loud do you yes, hear me can. yes yes we can yes we can okay thank you thank you very much uh my name is aban Mesheleni. 
I'm the acting director for the Department of Education, uh, Science, Technology, and Innovation. And we are the lead department in the African Union Commission that deals with uh, space matters, particularly from the perspective of policy issues, as well as engagement and uh, cooperation across the continent. I'm here to deliver a statement from His Excellency, the Commissioner, uh, Professor Mohammed Bel Hossin, who sends his warm greetings to you all. It is my profound honor to address this gathering of eminent persons in Africa and the United States. I want to sincerely thank the organizers of this important dialogue on Africa's huge opportunity for us to revitalize and ignite our cooperation between Africa and U.S. on space, which to us is long overdue, given that we already have space questions are looking forward for the continent and Agenda 2063 as a flagship program for the continent. I am pleased to recall that the African Union and the United States have enjoyed a good partnership in space over the past years. In 2015, uh, Major General Charles Bolden from NASA Cooperation the United States agents cooperating and supporting our programs such as the USAID that supported the focus on implementation of our African space policy and strategy uh, within our member states. Today, the governments, academia, and the private sector are all rising to the call of building a robust African space ecosystem. We need an African market. This is in line with the African space strategy that aims at creating a market for space services and ensuring that those services contribute to addressing the needs of the people. They will contribute to addressing the development of the continent. Growth in the African space sector is evidenced by the recent report by the space in Africa, which indicates that in 2021, the African space economy was valued at about uh, US 19.49 billion. By 2026, the African space sector, including Earth observation, satellite communication, navigation and positioning, as well as astronomy and space sciences, is projected to grow by 16.6%, hoping to reach to a value of about $22.64 billion. Furthermore, this industry is employing over 19,000 people across the continent. New space companies in Africa are emerging with different strategies to exploit the full potential of this growing market. Indeed, Africa is the second largest continent in the world with more than 1 billion inhabitants and a vast diverse swath of land and marine resources, coffee and ground monitoring. We've also established the, the continental free trade area that contributes to this great market. This presents a huge, unique opportunity for the space industry from ground, from the ground to the space segment through downstream and service development. The African Union 
permission has already fostered the necessary governance environment and, and mechanism for establishing the African Space Agent, which we hopefully is going to be hosted in the Arab Republic of Egypt and coordinate our space activities on the continent. The time to strengthen and to solidify the United States and Africa engagement, cooperation and dialogue on space exchange now. I strongly believe that this will lead to concrete partnerships in many areas within the space arena. In conclusion, I wish to issue a clarion call for high-level strategic engagement and dialogue between the United States and the African Union on the opportunities of mutually beneficial partnerships of space. I look forward to an actionable roadmap that will elaborate the framework of our future engagement and cooperation. I thank you. That was the statement the commissioner wished to deliver to you today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mashelene. And uh, please extend our thanks to His Excellency. We've noted uh, the, um, the points or issues raised by the commissioner and the request for uh, a roadmap and possibly a framework for uh, US-Africa uh, space partnership. So having listened to the keynote addresses, we can now turn over to um, our panelists. Uh, but before they, I introduce them one after the other, I would like to give kind of a background and a context for our discussion. Even though uh, the commissioner has already mentioned um, some of the things I actually wanted to point out. Um, as we, we are aware, or maybe some of us are aware, President Joe Biden is hosting the second US Africa Leaders Summit in mid December, just a few weeks from now. Um, the first of those summits, the first US Africa Leaders Summit, was held in August 2014, and that was hosted by President um, Barack Obama. And um, if you remember, the theme of that summit was investing in the next generation. Shortly after the summit in November 2014, as um, the commissioner has pointed out, um, the then administrator of NASA, General Charlie Bowden, visited the AUC. He was accompanied at that um, visit um, by Ambassador Ruben Brigetti, uh, who at that time was the US ambassador to Ethiopia and the African Union Commission and then Dr. Glenn Rogers from the USAID and some other colleagues. Uh, according to the administrator, uh, the purpose of his visit at that time was threefold. One, to know more about AUC perspectives, to identify possible areas of cooperation, and of course, to discuss approaches and expectations from a potential US-Africa partnership. So in line with those uh, three objectives or purpose, there were three major areas for discussion at that meeting. Uh, I, I was privileged to be part of that meeting. Mr. Marshallin was there, and um, Dr. Mahama was also there at that meeting. The, the three major areas was STEM, one, two, the Pan-African University Institute of Space Science, which I think Tidia may want to, Mr. Uh, Dr. Otara will want to say a bit more about, and of course, space education and outreach. Shortly after that visit, President Obama himself um, visited the AUC the following year in July 2015 and addressed the African Union at the famous um, Nelson Mandela Hall. And of course, one of the issues that was raised was U.S. Africa relations. So now, next month, President Bowden is hosting this second summit. And um, in his remarks, according to his, uh, Mr. President, he said the summit would demonstrate the United States' enduring commitment to Africa and will underscore the importance of US-Africa relations and increase cooperation on shared global priorities. So as outer space is of mutual interest to US and Africa, the African Space Leadership Institute decided to organize this roundtable for experts from the US and also from Africa to share their thoughts on how to strengthen space cooperation between the US and Africa. 
So specifically, we have three major objectives which we hope to achieve in this round table. And these are one, to identify possible areas of cooperation, um, policy related programs, projects between US and Africa. Two, to initiate a mechanism for periodic dialogue between Africa and the US on space related issues of mutual interest. And three, to gather thoughts on a framework for US Africa space partnership. And as has been requested by the ambassador, for the US ambassador to South Africa, as well as the AUC commissioner. So with this background now, I now turn over to our panelists uh, to uh, share their thoughts and for us to see how we can meet the objectives which we've set and also to respond to the issues uh, which have been raised uh, in the keynote addresses by His Excellencies. So the structure of the uh, program will be uh, uh, maybe this way. We are, each of the panelists will first of all give an opening remark. And then after that, this will be followed by discussion among the panelists. And then of course we have discussion with the audience. So if we have any questions, we can put the questions on the chat box. And um, of course I already have some questions from some participants that are coming earlier. So I'm going to bring uh, post these questions to the panelists as we go on. So we start first with uh, Dr. Tidian Utara and uh, just a brief um, bio about Dr. Utara before he gives his opening remark. Dr. Tidian Utara received a PhD and a master's degree both in remote sensing and geographic information system from Sherbrooke University in Canada respectively in 2001 and 1996. He also holds a master's degree in physical geography from University de Cocody, Abidjan, Côte d'Ivoire. Dr. Utara is currently space science expert and coordinator for GMS and Africa program. He's actually wearing two caps in that position. As a space science expert, he's responsible for the implementation of the African Space Policy and Strategy as well as the African Outer Space Program. As a coordinator for GMS and Africa program, he's responsible for the implementation of several projects under the Global Monitoring for Environment and Security Program. Dr. Otara began his career in Canada as a lecturer at Sherbrooke University from 1996 to 2001, where he taught not only scientific courses, but also African geopolitics and sociocultural issues. After a brief stay with the private sector in Montreal, Canada, Dr. Otara started working with the federal government of Canada. He successfully occupied various positions, including international relations manager in charge of Africa, Central and South America, and the United Nations. He was also at one time the senior science and policy advisor for the assistant deputy minister of natural resources and he was also at one time the manager of Canadian Digital Elevation Model Program. Uh, I, I, I mean, I have a long CV for him, but I'll just stop there so that um, uh, we can have a lot more time for discussion. So Dr. Otara, you have the floor, please. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, a team. Uh, I would say uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting us um, for this important uh, uh, milestone. Um, I would say this discussion is coming at the appropriate time. Uh, why? Because in Africa currently, we have several opportunities that we have to seize. At the policy level, we have the African Space Policy and Strategy, which is in place. We also have the Agenda 2063, which is the compass for the development or uh, sustainable development of African countries. Now at the governance level, as you've said, the African Space Agency is now a reality, it will be in Cairo. Therefore, this discussion can really be uh, the source for, 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 for input that will uh, support the development of the African Space Program per se. Also, in terms of governance, I will say welcome to ASLI, which is uh, coming and uh, enhancing the ecosystem of stakeholders involved in space in Africa. 
It will be a platform for discussions, for policy discussions, strategy discussion, strategic discussions. Therefore, it is very well, uh, really, uh, it is more than welcome. At the programmatic level, I would say that in Africa now, space is becoming a reality through several programs. There is GMS in Africa, there is Digital Earth Africa, but most importantly, with respect to United States, we have Sergier. Even this morning, we had a bilateral discussions with our colleagues from NASA and other institutions from the United States on Servier, the connection with the GMS and also African Union other programs. I would say thank you to ASLI for bringing us together. Let's discuss what could be very important and what could be in common interest for both continents or both uh, parts meaning United States and Africa. In doing that, we also have to take into account the national space agencies, the regional space policies and strategies in Africa. We have to be able to connect the dot with concrete proposals, but we have to be very well aware of the fact that one of the biggest challenges for Africa will be to develop the critical human capital. Therefore, capacity building in terms of infrastructure, in terms of training, should be in the center of the discussion with the United States. Thank you very much. That was my introductory remark. Uh, thank you, Dr. Otara, for the introductory remark. And um, while I still have you, if I can ask you just a quick question. Uh, you, you mentioned the African Space Agency. Um, what is the current status of the uh, implementation of the operationalization of the agency? And um, what are the avenues of partnership for the US academic and the corporate institutions with respect to the African Space Agency? Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, A-Team. I would say, first of all, we have to congratulate all the African citizens because the, the establishment of the African Space Agency has been uh, a, long a long process, starting with the African Working Group years ago. And here online, we have some pioneers. You know, we, we, we have uh, Dr. Val, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Abiodun. I, I would say, I would just quote these uh, 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 important figures uh, in the space arena. But we also have to congratulate uh, Dr. Mahama and Masheleni Ambani, uh, who spoke uh, before, because you know, they put together all the pieces. And the African Space Agency is a reality. Now, we are supposed to be in Cairo next month to finalize all the things with uh, the uh, Egyptian government. That being said, the African Space Agency is an organ of the African Union Commission. De facto, all African countries are members of the African Space Agency. Secondly, the African Space Agency, as it is said in the African Space Policy, and strategy will have as main role to coordinate the continental space program. That is very important, meaning building on national and regional capacities and uh, uh, initiatives. That should be very well understood. And this space agency, being an organ of the African Union Commission, will work according to the rules, policies, and mechanisms of the African Union Commission. Therefore, any collaboration with any institutions in the, you know, in the world will go through an established process we all know through the African Union established process for cooperation. Now, in Africa, all is to be done at the space level. Therefore, it is plenty of full of opportunities, depending, as I've said at the introductory remark, depending on the, benefit, uh, the mutual benefits we have to look at what is in the priorities of the Agenda 2063, because bottom line, these are the priorities the African Space Agency will be tackling on behalf of the member state. Okay, th thank you, Dr. Otara. Uh, I think we'll have more discussions relating to the agency and to other African Union initiatives with respect to space. Um, next, um, of my program here is uh, Professor Daniel Wood. 
And uh, before she comes to give her opening rem uh, remarks, I'll just read a brief bio about Professor Wood. Professor Daniel Wood serves as an um, assistant professor in media arts and sciences and holds a joint appointment in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, USA. Um, within the MIT Media Lab, Professor Wood leads the Space Enabled Research Group, which seeks to advance justice in Earth's complex systems using designs enabled by space. Professor Wood is a scholar of societal development with a background which includes satellite design, earth science applications, systems engineering, and technology policy. In her research, she applies these skills to design innovative systems that harness space technology to address development, development challenges around the world. Prior to serving as faculty at MIT, Professor Wood held positions at NASA headquarters, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, the Aerospace Corporation, John Hopkins University, and um, at the UN USA. Professor Wood studied at MIT, where she earned a PhD in engineering systems, master's in aeronautics and astronautics, master's in technology policy, and a bachelor's in aerospace engineering. Thank you, Professor Wood. You have the floor, please. Thank you so much, Etim, and to everyone. Are you hearing me well? Yeah, very well, thank you. Perfect. It is my honor to be your guest today, and thank you for including me in this important event. And thank you also to all those who are making possible the African Space Leadership Institute. My name is Professor Wood, as you've heard, and I lead a team at MIT called Space Enabled. Our mission is to ask how we can be part of teams that redesign space technology to be more sustainable, both on Earth and in space. It means we're often asking how technology from space can be designed so that it increases the benefit to people around the world, particularly in areas of sustainability, both economically, environmentally, as well as socially. We emphasize six technology areas, including earth observation, satellite communication, satellite positioning, the benefits and knowledge we gain through human spaceflight, basic space research, and technology transfer. We note that in each of these areas, there are already benefits to countries around the world, but there's a need for increased design approaches to make sure the benefits are spread more broadly. I've also been asking the question, what are the challenges for space debris and other concerns around space sustainability? So sustainability is a challenge we're facing on Earth and in space. And I'm particularly interested in how the risks regarding space sustainability impact emerging space nations. As humans expand our activities uh, on Earth, but also in space into new locations, as you see an increase in interest in the moon and beyond. I'm also interested in the different perspectives of countries and cultures around the world on what it means for humans to impact the environments beyond Earth. I think there's great wisdom that needs to be drawn by listening to different cultures to guide human activities uh, in space activities beyond Earth. I'm also here because I'm very inspired by the ways that leaders in African countries are creating opportunities to harness space technology to address local goals, as well as the work that's happening in innovation across Africa and space. I can share a little bit that part of the reason I'm here is from uh, many years of collaborating with people across Africa, both as someone who's a student learning about activities in space in Africa, and now as a co-creator of projects. I first had a chance to visit Kenya in 2001. That was my first experience uh, visiting a country in Africa, and I was eager to ask how my training in aerospace engineering as an undergraduate student was an opportunity to make connections and collaborations. It took me a few years to find the answer, but later I began studying activities uh, all over Africa and how countries in Africa were applying satellite earth observation, communication, and positioning. So even in my master's period in 2008, as I was studying different activities, I was seeing strong evidence of how countries in every part of Africa are applying these tools for sustainable development. And I was continuing to be hosted by different countries and was thankful for the hospitality from people in South Africa, Ghana, Kenya, and Nigeria, as I learned more about your national space program. So thank you to all who hosted me and gave me a chance to learn about your innovation stories. Now, as I'm leading this team at MIT, it's my honor to be collaborating with several teams in different parts of Africa, focusing on applying space technology for local goals. Currently, I'm co-leading projects that are done at the invitation of leaders, both from universities, companies, as well as government agencies in several parts of Africa. In particular, I wanna highlight a project we have uh, with Gigi Pin, with the National 
management office of the Space Agency uh, in Angola. And they have invited myself and several other collaborators to work with them on designing a drought monitoring system focused on the southern region of Angola, but really addressing the whole country. And we are funded through a grant by NASA to work closely with them over several years. As part of this project, we'll use satellite data from NASA's MAP, our Soil Moisture Active Passive Mission. And it will help us to design a system that will be a website with interactive data focusing on measuring the extent of drought in different parts of the country, but also considering how the drought is overlapping with socioeconomic vulnerability. So part of the question we can help explore is uh, what areas are experiencing drought, but also what are the social and economic impacts in those areas? And how can response workers consider both short-term responses to deliver uh, support for it's needed, as well as long-term planning for changing infrastructure to respond to the cycles of drought and flooding? In another example, I'm collaborating with a team from Benin, hosted by the company called Greenkeeper Africa. And in particular, we're focusing on using satellite data from NASA and other sources to monitor and manage invasive plants. And with a team from Ghana, I'm working on the topic of deforestation due to mining. All of these projects are at the invitation of local companies, universities, or government agencies. And we're finding ways to use satellite data, especially from NASA, but also from other parts of the world, to design information systems that respond to local goals. And to me, this is the exciting part is that so many innovators across Africa have ideas around how they'd like to use space technology, whether it's remote sensing, communication, positioning, and other innovations to address local needs. And it's my honor to have the opportunity to, sometimes to join these teams to be part of this uh, innovation. I'm also looking forward to seeing uh, the continued leadership. I see a strong uh, voice from countries in Africa on the topic of space sustainability and the need to uh, make sort of equal opportunity around the world for the use of the space environment. And I've taken uh, great inspiration from the work by different leaders across Africa uh, on the topic of space debris, especially in the United Nations context. Our team is working on the space sustainability rating, which is a system designed to incentivize all operators to reduce their production of space debris and to promote the need for taking good techniques during a space mission to reduce collision risk. And one message we wanna share is that we are finding that there's possible possibilities for actors of all experience levels uh, to use this approach and to uh, reduce space debris even without great cost. But it's an important topic as we discuss within the African region, uh, how also are you asking countries around the world to take these methods to reduce debris so that we all have opportunities in the future to use space sustainably. So thank you so much. I look forward to the next discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Wood. And thank you for all the projects that, you, uh, that you're facilitating across um, different African countries. Uh, there was a question that was sent in by one of the participants and I'll just quickly add, pose that question to you, if you don't mind. It says, um, how can US and Africa partner to prepare future space engineers and scientists in Africa, including strengthening STEM in schools? And I'm posing that question to you because of your past activities in Africa and the things you are currently doing in Africa. Thank you so much. I think there's a number of opportunities. Uh, some are already in place and some I think will grow. Uh, partly there's a question of how we can connect a network uh, with you know, leadership in Africa of the universities that are seeking to increase opportunities to train the university level, to be exposed to uh, topics related to aerospace, to robotics, to computer science. Uh, often uh, we have programs that could be shared and we need to consider which languages to include them in. And I think if there were uh, the ability for a team like mine in the US to link to a network of communities uh, within Africa, then we could have a chance to share that information in a, in a broad way but also in ways that can be customized to each region, considering issues of language and, and timelines and time schedules. I do work on a project called uh, Zero Robotics, which is a program that focuses on uh, training youth in the ages of like 12 to 18 to work on coding. And we're teaching them to code robots that are operated in the space station. Right now, we're offering it to US youth and we're in a phase of learning technology and developing our method. We use the Astro B robot that's on the International Space Station currently. I would hope in the future that this could be more international. It has been in the past. And as we update our technology, it may be a chance for organizations across different continents to engage and to have a chance for both university students and youth to get involved with learning space robots and learning how to code, uh, both in simulation, but also with an actual robot that's actually floating uh, in microgravity on the ISS. This is a future vision, but I think we can start, can start now to ask, how can we build a network so that once we have the materials ready, we can start to train 
And we do it from MIT through virtual relationships, meaning the material can be shared virtually, we can share things online, and we don't have to travel to do that kind of collaboration. So I think there's opportunities to build a network, networks like this in the future. Plus, of course, we could take advantage of the existing capabilities of things like the NASA GLOBE program that links students around the world to state science and earth science as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Daniel Wood. And, um, so I think we move on to the uh, next panelist. Uh, and I think I want to call Professor Scott Pace uh, because he has another engagement now. So I think it's just better to hear from him. Uh, just as a bio, uh, Professor Scott Pace rejoined the faculty of the Elliott School of International Affairs in 2021 after serving as deputy assistant to the president and executive secretary of the National Space Council from 2017 to 2020. He previously served as the associate administrator for program analysis and an evaluation at NASA from 2005 to 2008 and Deputy Chief of Staff for the NASA Administrator from 2002 to 2003. Prior to NASA, he was the Assistant Director for Space and Aeronautics in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. From 1993 to 2000, he worked for the Rand Corporation Science and Technology Policy Institute. And from 1990 to 1993, he served as the Deputy Director and Acting Director of the Office of Space Commerce in the Office of the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Commerce. He received a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics from Harvey Mood College in 1980, a Master's degree in Aeronautics and Astronautics and Technology uh, and Policy from MIT, just like Professor Daniel Wood, and a Doctorate in Policy Analysis from Rand Graduate School in 1989. Uh, thank you, Professor Scott Pace, for joining us. You have the floor, please. Okay. Thank you very, thank you very much, Shetam. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, and. Uh, uh, as people know, Etam is a, is a veteran of the Space Policy Institute here in the U.S., and uh, so I'm thrilled to uh, see him taking that uh, energy to uh, to Africa and, uh, and and working on this important initiative for an African uh, policy institute. Um, uh, first of all, uh, pretty much everything Danielle Wood said, I agree with, and there's there's more, so I won't try to repeat uh, the good things she covered. Uh, but a couple of really very top level observations. One is if we look at UN sustainable development goals, uh, it's clear that space is vital to virtually all of them. Uh, you don't, you don't achieve these goals without, uh, without space capabilities. Uh, the second, uh, we were very, I think in the US uh, and around the world, very gratified at the recent election of, uh, Doreen Bogdan Martin, uh, to be from the ITU development sector. Uh, to become ITU Secretary General, and uh, again, we very much appreciate the support uh, from African countries uh, for her candidacy. And I think one of the things that was helpful is a recognition that she had of the importance of space uh, and technology to developing countries. She had a, a good knowledge of that, and uh, that uh, that the leadership of the ITU needs to pay attention to the needs of developing countries. There's almost three billion people who are not connected uh, and online. Uh, and uh, one of her top priorities is mobile broadband communication. Uh, I think all of us on this call can appreciate the importance of, of good mobile broadband communication. And in many ways, this is especially vital uh, for Africa, not just in terms of connecting to the rest of the world, whether Europe or Asia or Latin America or North America, but connecting within Africa. Uh, as you know, one of the historical legacies, it's sometimes easier to go uh, to Europe than it is to go uh, someplace else in Africa, uh, within Africa. And uh, so increasing cross-continental ties, uh, like this institute is trying to do, facilitated by um, space infrastructure, uh, particularly mobile communications, I think is vitally critical, vital to uh, Africa's development. Uh, and so uh, there are other technologies that I think provide stepping stones uh, that Africa can prioritize for development. Uh, GPS and remote sensing technologies have the ability to directly benefit infrastructure, whether survey, construction, trucking, all kinds of very, very practical sorts of activities. You know, I'm mindful of, of course, of uh, the competition for resources and limited resources in Africa, so priorities have to be set. Uh, and there are examples uh, like India, which for many years uh, focused very intensely on internal development. Uh, before moving on to uh, larger, more ambitious projects uh, as they are today. 
Uh, and I think that intense focus on development needs and the needs of local citizens in the community was helpful to building a strong political foundation for supporting space. Uh, of course, it's desirable to, uh, to have some inspirational programs, uh, but I think it's possible to have inspirational prestige programs uh, without sacrificing uh, practical benefits, and especially in partnership, uh, I think, with commercial companies providing space as a service. Uh, some very ambitious projects are now more possible today than they were in the past. Uh, recently, uh, I saw, I noticed um, uh, friends of mine at uh, Astrobotic, which many of you know is a commercial lunar delivery company about to do their first launch. Uh, they uh, successfully integrated a payload package uh, from Mexico uh, on their lander. And that this, therefore Mexico will be the first Latin American country to have a payload on the moon. And they did this in partnership with the U.S. providing space as a service, but 250 Mexican students and, and, and faculty made up this package. They created it, it's theirs, they own it, um, and uh, they developed their own capacity. And so I think we were happy to facilitate that and provide an opportunity, uh, but it was really theirs. Uh, and they know uh, every, every nut and bolt uh, on that package. Uh, in terms of areas for uh, multilateral uh, cooperation, uh, with uh, with Africa, um, there are a couple of basic ones. First of all, coordination on uh, in multilateral form, uh, like uh, like the ITU and the Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Um, second, of course, is international science cooperation, particularly in environmental issues, where African countries can can participate at various levels. Uh, I think it's also important for promoting commerce. Uh, regulatory barriers to foreign direct investment, technical barriers to acquiring equipment and services uh, that, on one hand, Africa needs uh, to have uh, its own capacity and, and, and prioritize its own development. At the same time, it probably can do that faster in partnership uh, in the commercial sector, but partnerships that prioritize development of African capabilities, not just the importation of, of equipment and hardware uh, from overseas that that local people don't know how to operate. So it's important to build, I think, bottom up. And I think U.S. commercial companies and European companies and others, I think, can help uh, with that. And then uh, finally, uh, I'd like to also uh, uh, make a note that, uh, that one of the most important uh, things for internal development, of course, is inspiring uh, students and, and education and, and showing what's possible. Uh, now, a much, uh, uh, you know, wealthier new entrant, uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh, has, of course, been doing some ambitious missions to, to Mars, and, uh, and uh, they're going to be uh, working with us on, on Gateway and the Artemis program, uh, which, by the way, is open to all African countries to sign the Artemis Accord. So if you're considering that, I, you know, please uh, contact your local state, state Department embassy and ask how to do that. Um, uh, but one of the reasons the UAE has been doing this uh, is because not just for technical development, not just to diversify their economy, but also provide a hopeful future for their own young people, uh, that there are now ways to be a physicist in the UAE and have a job in a way that wasn't possible before, uh, that uh, it's not just uh, sort of oil and trading, but in fact, there are very creative technical contributions that new generations of Emirati citizens can make. And that same kind of inspiration and hopeful future, uh, I think is uh, what's important for Africa and space can play a strong role. So thank you very much for your, your time. Well, thank you, Professor Pace, for your opening remarks. Um, Professor Space has a lecture now, but please, before you go, if I can just pose uh, one or two questions to you from, um, from the participants. Um, you talked about uh, promoting um, commerce, and one of the things you mentioned was um, regulatory barriers. And we have a question here which says, um, how will Africa leverage on a partnership with USA in view of the stringent export control regime that the U.S. has on space technology. Sure. Um, so uh, no, uh, uh, no uncertainty about this. Uh, the U.S. is opposed to the proliferation of uh, missile technology, um, and so we have very stringent export controls on what we consider uh, in, within the missile technology uh, control regime. Uh, but I would point out 
that uh, actually uh, much of space technology uh, that is of practical use uh, for commercial development is already widely available. GPS receivers, for example, started as a military uh, technology, but for over 30 years has been a general destination item that's exported all over the world. Uh, remote sensing data and services uh, coming from space are also exported. Arc, uh, uh, Arc Info and uh, GIS, Geographic Information Systems software, also really widely available. Uh, so if, if there are observations that, uh, that uh, there are strong limitations on export of military uh, technology, particularly launcher and missile technology, that is absolutely true. Um, on the other hand, the technologies that are most, uh, that make the most money, frankly, which is in space services, are widely available. And usually the barriers we find are uh, technical barriers to trade and limitations on, on importing of foreign items or high taxes and tariffs. Uh, on those items. Uh, so I think in terms of money making, I, I don't think there's a real limitation uh, in terms of uh, developing maybe uh, separate, uh, you know, military uh, technologies, capabilities, yeah, there'll probably be, be limitations. So I think we should just cooperate where we can. Okay, Professor Pace, and if I can just sneak in one more question, since you mentioned the Artemis programs and the Artemis Accords, um, there's a question here, somebody says, um, U.S. policymakers warn about the increasing involvement of China's space technology programs in Africa, but have yet to provide any alternatives in the area of space partnership beyond an open invitation to Artemis. How can the U.S. or what can the U.S. do to be a more attractive partner to African countries? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think that. Um uh, there's both a government uh, part and a uh, and a commercial part. I think one of the things that the U.S. could do better uh, at uh, is in the Development Finance Corporation, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, mostly is known for uh, big infrastructure projects, um, you know, ports, harbors, rails, airports. But actually, space capacity building uh, is something I think Development Finance Corporation could better help with. And I think. Uh, the advantage uh, that I would hope we would bring to it uh, is is in local capacity building. Uh, a common complaint that I, I hear uh, in in partnering with with China is that uh, Chinese do the job, but Africans don't necessarily get to do the job or are employed in doing it. Uh, never mind comments about loans and and all that. Uh, but I can't blame an African country if if China is the only option there. I think the U.S. Uh, should provide alternatives. And if a country chooses to go with China, well, okay, uh, that's their choice. But I don't think we should be in a situation where China is the only option. And I think the American way of cooperation, both governmentally and commercially, uh, would place much more emphasis on, on indigenous development and capacity building. Um, because frankly, that's the only way it's going to be sustainable in the longer term, is, is if local people do it. And uh, if that grows the African economy and grows the partnership, that's going to be better for us because we'll have a better market to work with and we'll have uh, better partners uh, who can, um, frankly, buy and trade with us at higher levels than is currently the case. So I think our longer term self-interest uh, is in African capacity building. But we need to show up and, and we haven't done as much as we should today. Over. Thank you, Professor Kropis, and we uh, really appreciate your coming and we look forward to more engagement with you and, of course, um, with um, the SPI as we go on in this process. Okay. My, my apologies. I have, a, I have to go teach class. So, yeah. see you. Take care. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, uh, next I'll call on the... Um, uh, Professor Papatunde Rabiu to give his opening remarks. Uh, just a brief bio about Professor Rabiu. Uh, Papatunde Rabiu is a professor of space physics and has been the director, chief executive of the Center for Atmospheric Research of the National Space Research and Development Agency, that's the Nigerian Space Agency. He has been the chief executive since January 2013. His research interest lies mainly in atmospheric physics space weather, solar terrestrial interactions, ozone variability, and air quality. He served as the pioneer president of the African Geophysical Society between November 2012 and November 2016. He's a fellow of a number of academic societies, including the Royal Astronomical Society in UK, 
the Nigerian Geophysical Society, Society for Environmental Toxicology and Pollution Mitigation, as well as the Astronomical um, Society of Nigeria. He's also a member of many professional bodies, including Nigerian Institute of Physics, the American Geophysical Union, the African Geophysical Society, the American Geophysical Union, um, and the U.S. Institute of Navigation, that is the IOM. He's a national adherent representative of, the, of Nigeria in the Scientific Committee on Solar Terrestrial Physics. That's a, an arm of the International Council of Science. He's also a member of the, United, of the UN New Expert Group on Space Weather. At the moment, he's the African coordinator of the International Space Weather Initiative, which he mentioned at, uh, when we were at the introduction, and serves at the, on the International Steering Committee of the UN NASA endorsed global cooperation. So we see that Professor Rabiu has quite a lot of ties between the US and Africa. Uh, thank you, Professor Rabiu, for coming. Uh, you have the floor, please. Yeah, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Etsy. And I want to thank the organizers for this uh, privilege to be here. Uh, please, I want to say here that the the internet connectivity has been very bad in this uh, five-star hotel where I'm lodged in uh, Azerbaijan, and uh, it's been half and half. Uh, so please, you bear with me if... Uh, I'm not able to communicate effectively. Uh, I think the idea of this meet of this roundtable is very great and is highly welcome. And uh, I want to say, like others have been, uh, have also mentioned, the U.S. Uh, U.S. has played the role of a big brother to Africa in many ways, and. Uh, uh, it has been mentioned earlier on as well that, for example, the the GPS uh, technology has been given to the whole world, including Africa, and uh, the Landsat images have also been give, made available to everyone. Uh, now, there are many other things that the U.S. has done for us in Africa. Uh, a lot of uh, U.S. scientists like we had from uh, Professor Daniel Woods that get the NSF funding to fund projects in Africa. Uh, and I think, uh, well, we can ask for more, but then we stand also to, to benefit more. Uh, maybe we need to look at the approach, the way we get things done in Africa as a continent. And I think that's one of the things that this roundtable should look at. You should look at how we put our housing order in Africa so that we can benefit from the expected uh, summit. Otherwise, uh, our expectation may not actually work out. Uh, I've listened to the uh, His Excellency from the African Union. Uh, the African Space Agency is kicking off in Egypt, uh, and national bodies are also having a lot of countries now have a uh, national space agencies in Africa. Uh, we really need to look inward and see how we can synergize, how we can actually make sure that these developments are in the hands of the right people. I've seen the Professor Baki from Kenya here. We have been working together for years. Uh, and uh, some of the things that we do is to provide directions for, uh, to mentor people and also to play the role of advocacy in Africa, uh, both bef before the government and uh, individuals to encourage patronage of space products and uh, I'm sure we are having results. It might be not be as, as big on this kind of scale that we want it to be. Uh, I identified some little issues that probably this roundtable will address. And I'm glad that we have the African Union here. Uh, there is no way 
the African space program can prosper when the real expertise, the real experts, the African experts are not actually patronized the way they should be patronized. Uh, it, 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 it may not really, that means that whatever we are querying may not actually be able to rub on us in Africa. I think uh, for me, I've, least, I've, I've, I've already read through some of the questions that uh, Etim circulated and uh, yes, we have answers. I mean, I have answers to some of them. And uh, if there are issues I'm to address, I will gladly address. I pray that network will allow me to do that. Uh, but at the same time, this is a very nice meeting for us. And uh, we have more things to benefit from the US uh, uh, in terms of uh, having a very good relationship with them and then having the, uh, the summit. And uh, we need to prepare documents and put things together. I think uh, it will be very useful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Rabiu. Um, so, um, just um, before I allow you to go, um, one of the projects you've been very instrumental um, or you've been very involved in is the um, GNSS um, and Space Weather Program at, um, at ICTP in Italy, which has been partly uh, supported by Boston University in the US. Would you like to share some light on that initiative and how you're trying to um, do I use the word internalize the knowledge and um, uh, opportunities created by that initiative? How you're trying to internalize it within Africa? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as mentioned earlier on, uh, Professor Baki from Kenya is on this platform as well. Uh, some of us uh, were there at the beginning. In 2009, we started having annual capacity building program at uh, Abdul Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics in Italy. And the project has been largely supported by the US, uh, Boston College, and the, and, and the, and the ICTP in Italy. Uh, in this project, over 600 till date, we just had the, this year's edition about two weeks ago, over 600 Africans have been trained and have been equipped with the capacity, capacity or to capability to use uh, GNSS technologies, uh, both for positioning and also to study space weather and uh, to do even prediction of space weather. And so some national states now like Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, Egypt have capability to predict space weather. And uh, we have scientists that are doing so well in this field everywhere in Africa right now. Uh, we can still get more of this done. And uh, also some national countries like Kenya, Nigeria, uh, Egypt, Ivory Coast, they are also uh, internalized internalizing this particular training right now, uh, you, it will be of interest for you to know that the one we had recently, the training we had in ICTP about three weeks ago, was partly sponsored by Kenya Space Agency. And uh, for the first time, that space agency paid the way of about four Kenyans to attend that meeting. And I think, so we, we are getting some results uh, it's just that, like I said, it might not be on a very large scale the way it should be, but I'm glad that uh, most nations in Africa or some nations in Africa are waking up to their responsibilities right now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor so, so, Rabiu. And um, I yeah. personally also want to thank you because I had the opportunity of attending the very first meeting in 2009. Uh, so thank you for the knowledge and um, the, your efforts. Uh, actually, earlier on, earlier today, I was discussing with Dr. Abiodu about um, a program that is about to be launched by the Nigerian Vice President tomorrow at Bowen yes. University, and yeah. um, I told him that it's likely going to be one of your initiatives. I think that's one of the things he wants to yeah. 
discuss with you. Yes. Uh, yeah, the, the project is a, is a big one for Africa. And uh, the first, uh, we're having the, an equatorial HF radar, which is the first of its kind in the world. And uh, this project is a project between Virginia Tech in the, in the US, uh, Bowen University, and Nigeria government. Uh, our space agency uh, is standing in for the Nigerian government. And uh, our engineers, our, the engineers from my center, NASDAQ engineers, of course, have been the one working on the site for more than a year now. And 36 antennas have been raised already. In fact, it will be commissioned tomorrow by the vice president of Federal Republic of Nigeria. And our space agency staff are on ground right there in Nigeria. I was there last week. It's because of this, my trip to Azerbaijan that I could not stay back there. So uh, it's part of the things that we are doing with the, with the US government. Uh, but I'm glad to say that the Bowen University brought out a huge amount of money for this project as well. So but the expertise, the design of the, the technologies belong to Virginia Tech. And uh, right now, they are trying to get some fund. I learned they have not been able to get a fund, the NSF grants they want to use to back up the activities over there. But hopefully, maybe after this commissioning, they'll have more news to take home. Two professors from Virginia Tech universities are already on ground in Bowen University for this launch as well. Uh, it's going to be a global uh, space research infrastructure, the facility. It's sitting on about three acres of land in Bowen University, southwestern Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rabio. Uh, there are still some questions from participants, but I'll pose them to you uh, maybe after the initial remarks from um, colleagues. Okay. Uh, so, so I'll call on um, Ms. Rose Grosia to give her opening remarks. Um, Rose Grosia is a policy fellow at the Center for Global Development, where our work focuses on enabling low and middle income countries' adoption of space based technology. Before joining CGD, Croatia was an accomplished program and operations manager with the US Air Force, specializing in areas such as space operations, security cooperation and development, peacekeeping, disaster management, and military intelligence. Croatia has held various positions in the intersection between security, diplomacy, and development, serving as a staff officer in the US Tax Force in Djibouti, as a blue helmet in the UN mission to the Democratic Republic of Congo. As the chief of US security cooperation for Ghana, Togo, and Benin, and as the US liaison to the Kobianan International Peacekeeping Training Center. Concerning space and technology innovation, Croatia held leadership positions at the National Air and Space Intelligence Center and Air Force Material Command, where she contributed to the development of new US systems and capabilities. Lastly, Croatia greatly values her early career, hands-on experience as a space operator at the US Combined Space Operations Center in California, tracking the ever-growing global constellation of Mami satellites and space debris. She has a master's in diplomacy and international commerce from Norwich University in Northfield, Vermont. Thank you, Ms. Krusia, for joining us. You have the floor now. Thank you. I, I am absolutely delighted to be here. Um, and it's, it's always so weird to hear my, my own bio, but I will riff off of that because uh, I, I spent about the last 10 years before coming to the Center for Global Development working on capability and capacity building um, across, you know, with many objectives. So it could be, it was peacekeeping, it was maritime security, um, it was pandemic response because I, I was in West Africa during Ebola. And I have to say, um, I kept seeing how space applications could be uh, really a game changer, but uh, neither the US nor, you know, frankly, my partners were necessarily uh, thinking about it. It wasn't one of the tools, you know, that comes to mind when you're trying to figure out how to address um, these issues. So when I joined CGD, uh, it's been my mission to to really kind of work through this, you know, and, and uh, I guess I, I'd really say, uh, you know, we, we really just need to expand 
our idea of, of what we mean by by space. You know, it's not just building and launching satellites. It's you know, how do you localize all of these different types of technology options to to priority problems? How do you anchor it? You know, in in reality um, and. Uh, I think I think uh, space offers some some really fantastic um, tools. You know, so position navigation and timing, as we've been talking about, um, using using communications, using the space segment of communications to expand, extend, and deepen communications infrastructure, and of course, you know, remote sensing or Earth observation data of all sorts. You know, can be combined with these capabilities to to support all sorts of development goals and and other you know address other national priorities or concerns. Um, I also, I, I, at the center of my work, I think about the role of the government. Um, and I'd say, you know, any small, any country, depending on, you know, how, how, another, how small or how large, you know, has a responsibility, has an interest in establishing a sort of an internal core space capability so that they can, you know, deliberately have that localization role, that, that advising role internally to help determine like where is space useful and, and what could that possibly look like when it comes to government activity. Um, it's, it's connecting the various uh, sectors, so academia, private sector, civil sector, and government to get them to work together, sort of encourage a positive feedback loop between those to you know, deliberately use space capabilities, but also kind of grow the ecosystem and connect to the data ecosystem. I'd say the two are heavily um, overlapping. Um, you know, and also, you know, talking about that space e infrastructure, I think there's a lot of work that can be done to really maximizing existing satellites. You know, you don't have to necessarily launch a satellite in order to become, you know, quite, quite active in space. You know, uh, there's space as a service, of course, there's a lot of free data that's available or increasingly, uh, or, or, you know, less expensive data that could be tapped into. But in all cases, it does really require a, a certain domestic uh, ability to you know, download that information, uh, process it in a useful way, get it, you know, out to the end user, whoever that may be. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be on a computer screen. It can be via, you know, information that's, that's sent out over the radio. It can be, you know, a cell phone text, you know, uh, it's sent over a region. There's a lot of different ways it could actually look at the end of the day. And maybe those end users don't even have any idea that has something to do with space. And that's just fine. You know, um, most people who are not thinking about space every day, you know, are not, necessarily convinced it's so vital to their lives, even though it's already so much embedded, you know, in, in many of our of our daily activities, you know, the financial infrastructure, utilities, um, even communications. So I think it's useful to, uh, to kind of help make those connections. Um, and then, you know, lastly, if I look forward to US and, and Africa at large cooperation, I think there's a ton of, of opportunity here. Uh, the space, the global space ecosystem continues to grow and diversify. It can be building code out of Botswana that can contribute to a space mission. It doesn't have to literally be a satellite every time. And uh, just the, the wealth and, and the, the, the wealth is found in that human capacity, in a diversity of perspective, in you know, addressing uh, or, or how we're all using this technology to apply to sort of unique and novel problems. This is all kind of enrichment of the ecosystem. And I think that is you know, equally of interest to, to the United States to, to support. Uh, so with that, I'll pause and uh, we'll see where the questions are and, and where the conversation goes. Thank you, Rose, and um, thanks for introductory remarks. And then finally, uh, Dr. Balanta Munsami uh, to give his opening remarks. And just a brief about Dr. Munsami. Uh, Dr. Munsami holds a PhD in physics, a master's of business leadership, a space studies um, program diploma from the ISU in Strasbourg, and a, uh, a certificate in international airspace and communications law. He worked in South Africa Secretariat for the non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. He managed the implementation of a suite of bilateral and multilateral science and technology agreements. He led the development of South Africa's national space strategy and national space policy. And he also oversaw the establishment of the South African National Space Agency. He also led the development of South Africa's multi wavelength astronomy strategy and the square kilometer array readiness strategy for Africa. Dr. Mosami chaired the African Union Space Working Group, which developed the African space policy and strategy. He also conceptualized the model for the Pan African Space Science University of the African Union. He is the immediate past CEO of SANSA, that's the South African National Space Agency, 
and at, in the, as, it, as a result of that position, he was also a member of the South African Council on Space Affairs. He's currently the Chancellor of the International Space University based in Strasbourg. He's a co-founder of the African Space Leadership and most recently, he was appointed as the advisor to the Saudi Space Commission. Dr. Mosami, you have the floor for your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Etienne, and thank you for such an engaging conversation. Uh, I think it's worthwhile just contextualizing. Just so, uh, contextualizing the what the collaboration could look like between the U.S. and Africa. Um, you know, most of the countries in Africa, and I think globally, we all aspire towards what the U.S. has achieved. So the U.S. is a source of global uh, inspiration for all of us. So in effect, we are all looking and aspiring towards being like the NASA of today. Um, but we also have to understand from a contextual point of view where we are in, in, in Africa. And there's a few countries that have established space uh, programs for a few decades already. And so we would consider them as developing countries. There's the developed, like the US, developing countries. And then there's a few countries that have just started to uh, starting to crawl. And so those are the emerging nations. So you have to look at how do we position ourselves uh, relatively to each other. So in a sense, the ones that are in the middle in, in the African perspective, like South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, and so on, who have started the space program for a few years ago, we also have a, a responsibility in terms of looking to the left and helping those countries that are starting to come out and establish the space programs to actually help to, uh, develop that capability. And so what I think is emerging, there's a, there's a particular trend that's emerging in Africa. And we've seen that there's a demand for space data. It's, that's increasing exponentially. Uh, the spend in the satellite, uh, especially in the development side on the, um, the upstream, is around $4 billion per, uh, to date. And that includes uh, the communication satellites, uh, and there's quite a few of those that have gone up. Interestingly, uh, uh, interestingly uh, a number that was put out by Space in Africa is that the national budgets of space programs uh, kind of almost doubled between 2019 and 2020, which kind of signals that there's something happening in Africa. And I think that's closely related to the realization of the value proposition of space science and technology in looking at how we de deliver on national challenges like uh, economic growth, or improving the quality of lives of citizens. And there's many different examples from that perspective. So what all of this is signifying is that there's specific drivers for collaboration from the African continent perspective. As I said, there's an increasing number of satellite projects, but we also have to understand that the upstream is not where the value of the space value chain lies. It's actually in the downstream. And I think Scott Pace mentioned that. And uh, Rose is also sort of intimated along those lines. Um, so we need to ensure that uh, the downstream needs to be unlocked. And I think Danielle is already doing a lot of work on the African continent in terms of bringing some of those uh, applications through. But what we also need to see in, in order to make that sustainable, both in the upstream and the downstream, is how do we grow the space industry? And I'm actually heartened uh, to see that the number of companies on the African continent is actually increasing. I think earlier this year we were in Kenya and I was actually amazed by the number of startups, especially in Kenya. Um, and then if you look at the EO Africa uh, sort of innovation challenge, we've seen quite an uh, extensive interest from across the, the continent uh, to put forward uh, innovative solutions in the downstream. And so we also see rising foreign interest in Africa and, and partly because of the resources that we have uh, on the ground. And also in looking at the number of applications that are increasing in terms of uh, space for sustainable development. So the policy drivers from the African perspective is actually changing quite rapidly. And that's also giving rise to a number of new entrants in terms of space agencies. I think we've seen close on to 15 in, uh, new space agencies on the African continent. Um, so how do we contextualize that in terms of collaboration? Uh, so obviously the political support is sort of ramping up, but we also need to 
quantify and, and utilize the arguments, the motivations around the socioeconomic benefits to drive the space programs, both from a user perspective. We also see increased financial resourcing, but I think I still think that, that it's suboptimal in terms of where we need to be from an African perspective. And so prioritization becomes very important. So what other niche areas should Africa be focusing on? And I think that's a, the question that we need to start answering from the African perspective. And when you start to do that, you also need to un, uh, unlock the fact that the, we, when we look at it from a technology readiness level perspective, we still need to travel some path. So technology transfer becomes quite key. And I think the kind of partnerships with the US it will be quite instrumental from that perspective. And also developing the human capital, the expertise. So knowledge transfer becomes quite critical. But you can't do any of these without the appropriate infrastructure in place. So building the infrastructure across the African continent is going to be very key. And I think Mesh sort of mentioned the fact that um, we also have to bootstrap what we have at a national level to bring that into a continental context now that we're having the African Space Agency uh, sort of coming on, on par. So all of this is geared towards building the African ecosystem. And I think there's a lot of energy and momentum around that, but we just need to make sure that we shape it and gear it in the right direction. And I think this takes a huge effort from a leadership perspective, but we also have to understand what the governance implications are because we have 55 African countries on and member states of the African Union, and how do we coordinate across 55 um, African countries? And so those are the kind of challenges we would need to address, but I think a US-Africa kind of partnership can help to address some of these challenges as well, in terms of bringing from partner that is well advanced and seeing how we can extract from that on the African side as well. But not forgetting that we have some heritage on the African side. Um, so let me, let me leave it there. Thank you. Well, so thank you, Val, uh, and thank you, everyone, for your opening remarks. Um, I, I think the discussions have already started, um, uh, and I'll encourage participants to, if you have any questions, you can just um, drop it in, in the chat box. Uh, I've already seen some questions here already. Um, there's a question from Dr. Mahama. Uh, the question is, um, how can space science be used for underground water mining and used particularly in semi-arid areas where water is um, scarce? And it's also asking whether there's any, is, is a potential in, um, area of interest for US um, Africa space cooperation? Uh, I don't know which of the panelists want to respond to that. Um, Daniel, Professor Wood. Thank you so much. I can certainly uh, start with the idea that uh, water management is a major topic, and I think uh, it brings to mind several topics that are part of the bigger picture. One category is coastal uh, ecosystems, and the question um, in the equatorial parts of Africa, we can ask the question, uh, what techniques are being used to maintain access, for example, to mangroves and wetlands that help protect and foster the health of ecosystems in the coastal area? And that leads also to discussions on fisheries. And as you come more inland, we can think about the, uh, the health and the management of rivers and of lakes and fresh water. And of course, there's different situations in urban and in rural areas. So satellite technology can play a role in all those categories. Some of the projects that I work on, we collaborate with biologists and remote sensing experts from NASA Goddard and several communities. I want to mention Professor, well, Dr. Lilipatiembo, who is like a professor, but works at NASA and leads a research team uh, with a lot of collaboration in parts of West Africa. Uh, mapping the coastal ecosystems, especially with mangroves. And these are areas that are really vital to economic and social uh, benefit. And then I want to mention uh, Professor Dara Antikabi, who's a collaborator here at MIT, who's working closely with me on our work in Angola and has expertise in hydrology. And Professor Antikabi is bringing this technique, especially with NASA's soil moisture active passive mission uh, to look at issues of water management. And the other category is GRACE. Uh, GRACE is an example of a satellite and the GRACE follow on mission. These allow uh, estimates of the types of materials that are underground. For example, uh, if there's a large body of water or perhaps solid rock underground, it uses the effect of these different materials underground on the emission itself and estimates uh, the, the mapping of what's underground so it's possible to estimate groundwater. 
So there certainly are a variety of different types of techniques that can be used to understand wetlands, as well as uh, inland water, like lakes and rivers, as well as um, below ground water. And I think what was interesting, uh, hearing the comments just now by uh, Dr. Masami, I was thinking about the question of what it means on one hand to sort of um, aspire to be like NASA. It's one direction, of course, and to its benefit, but also there's a question, what will be the innovations uh, that are different from NASA that might come from countries in Africa? And I'm curious to see how uh, the innovations in small satellites across different countries in Africa can bring different kinds of missions than they have done in the past that maybe would not be normally done by, by a country like the U.S. And so I think there's opportunities to explore. For example, uh, often it's really helpful to have ground-based data and to be able to collect data from ground-based sensors, uh, whether you're measuring rainfall, for example, in rural areas or uh, stream flow. Uh, when we do our work uh, using satellite data, we're often eager to get more examples of ground-based data uh, to understand water ecosystems. So having a, a lot of investment in ground-based data collection and sometimes using satellites, for example, to aggregate that data, these could be missions that are led by African countries because we want to increase both satellite data and ground-based data to have these kinds of maps. So I think uh, not just doing things the way NASA does it, but doing things the way it's uh, relevant to local needs could be really interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Wood. Um, Ms. Crossia, you want to add to that? Yeah. Yeah, I, well, I mean, this is such a great, such a great question. And, and to me, it gets to the point of having a balanced approach to all of the sectors relating to space to include your research community. So if this is a type of question that is of interest to your country, ideally, you're building researchers, you're building scientists who are looking at spectrum in new ways to try to best um, kind of best combine existing or drive demand for new sensors. Um, to to be able to to answer those kind of questions, um, you know, frankly, if most of our uh, research is being done, um, you know, in in Massachusetts or in Ohio, maybe it's more worried about uh, you know the the river level of the Mississippi River or or soybean. You know, it's not thinking about um, you know the specific challenges, the geographic considerations for a different area, particularly somewhere in in Sub-Saharan Africa, right? So it may not have the best um, algorithms, but if it's homegrown research, if it's research that's driving at those questions, um, we can we can more effectively, you know, localize, you know, really make data useful to to important issues that are that are, you know, specific to a particular state or area. Thank you, Ms. Crucia, um, Dr. Utara. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, team. Uh, just. Uh, I want to greet uh, my boss, Dr. Mahama. Uh, the question is more than relevant. Currently here, uh, during the Joe Week, we've seen Servir, which is funded by NASA, presenting concrete example of work they are doing in Western Africa, Eastern Africa, and Southern Africa, through Sandusubi Ecologic of Dakar, and also Arsia Mardi. Therefore, yes, Dr. Mahama, we have already on ground here in Africa, the cooperation between US and Africa using satellite data for water management, groundwater, even coastal areas, and also uh, surface waters, uh, water bodies. This is what I wanted to add. In terms of possibilities, it has been already demonstrated to what extent space can contribute to water management. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tara. And um, uh, maybe I'll just um, bring up the next question. Uh, so we have, uh, like you mentioned earlier, you have the GMS and Africa program, you have the Severe program, and uh, we also have the Digital Earth program. These are different programs of Act observation going on in Africa. And the question we have here is how, to what extent are we internalizing the knowledge, the R&D efforts, so that within Africa, we are able to uh, carry on some of these initiatives locally, uh, such that if GMS and Africa ends today, we can have earth observation programs going on, if SEVIA ends today, we can have other programs relating to applying EO satellites in Africa. So what are the efforts, uh, maybe for the African Union perspective and any other local perspective that you, uh, that you may want to share? Yeah, uh, th thank you, Tim. I would say 
Uh, with respect to uh, space applications, let's say Earth observation, we have to look at two angles. There are the operational services. They are not research and development, for sure. This is the case of GMS in Africa. GMS in Africa, we are not focused on research and development. The African Union Commission, in partnership with the European Space Agency, is pushing for EO for Africa, which is a really research and development oriented program. Now, whatever uh, situation is, meaning be operational, be research and development, this sustainability reside first in the ownership taken by African institutions themselves. What does it mean? GMS in Africa came with the approach that the proposals to get the grants came from the institution themselves, and we asked them to align that with regional policy and economic priorities. Therefore, to work with regional economic communities, because GMS is a regional and continental program. Now, we also know that the regional priorities are linked to the national priorities at the region level. Therefore, it is a common work. The space community will bring what they can bring. The policy and politi uh, policy makers, Alan analysts, will bring what they have to bring, and we, we, we build the package. But bottom line, the sustainability also resides in the fact that we are addressing the priorities of the Africans. Usually, uh, not usually, when sometimes we discuss with people, they think that we need to redo the will. No. The Agenda 2063, until further notice, is where you have the priorities as adopted by the countries, for the continent, I would say. It should be the guidelines. It should, be gui it should guide us toward where we want to land in 50 years, from 2013, I would say. Therefore, we don't need to redo the way. That is one thing. Secondly, all regional economic communities have their priorities. We know that. And at the country level, several countries have the, what they call the five-year plan, development plan. Let's look at how we connect the dot of these different strategies or plan and look at what we can address as space community. By the way, uh, my brother, Etim, the African Space Agency belongs to the Africans. What the African Union Commission is doing as a secretariat, it is to translate what the member states have decided. Therefore, when we hear African Space Agency cannot do that without that, let's see what African Union can do without the member state. It is about the member state. The program, everybody is asking what could be the program of the African Space Agency that is coming on board. I am current, I'm of, of most of the time surprised with that question because the African Space Policy and Strategy, once again, until further notice, is where we have the dreams, the priorities of the continent. We have to, stock, to, be, to, to stick on that because if we start redoing the will, we will never end. And it takes time to develop a policy. It takes time to develop a strategy. Perhaps there is a need to update it. Let update it through the established mechanism the African Union as an intergovernmental body in the continent is doing that. I will end in saying that the collaboration with the United States should be looked at three levels. There could be some bilateral relations. Why not? They are even doing that with uh, South Africa, Egypt already. There could be at the regional level and there could be at the continental level. This is what we discussed today during two hours with Digital Earth Africa and Servi and GMS. We had a meeting today to look at how to connect the dot, how to avoid duplications, how to strengthen each other. And finally, the human capital development came on board. And the human capital development is critical. Whatever we do, we talk about research, we talk about operational services, we should have people to be able to get them done. This is 
uh, in perspective some of the points I can raise here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tara. Uh, Dr. Musami, before you come up, please, uh, I, I see your hand, but I just want Dr. Tara to respond to uh, one of the issues that was raised by Professor Rabiu, and that is that the African Union Commission is not patronizing African space experts. Uh, and I th uh, one of the things that has been, one of the uh, issues that goes around is as if the African Union Commission is a lot more focused on earth observation whereas there are four aspects of the African space policy and strategy that earth observation, navigation and positioning, satellite communication, and um, space science, which of course that includes um, physics. Uh, so what, what's your thought on that? Uh, no, how uh, can- Excuse me, the, the moderator, I did not say that African Union uh, uh, is not patronizing the experts. African Union brought us together to develop the space policy, to develop the space strategy. So I'm not saying that African Union, uh, uh, the commission, did not, I mean, I, I didn't say that. Maybe you didn't get me clearly. All right. Okay. So, all, right. all right. Sorry, maybe I, maybe I missed that. But Dr. Otar, maybe you may want to uh, maybe just yeah. touch a bit more on the other for uh, three or two other areas of the space policy and strategy, uh, that's um, satellite communication, um, space science, and of course, navigation and positioning. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, I think uh, the brother did well in clarifying because I even understood the same as AD, ATIM when he was intervening, but it is very clear now. Uh, I think we are on the same wavelength. The African Union Commission, in the African space policy and strategy, all the four segments of the space are covered. SATCOM, Earth Observation, Navigation Positioning, Astronomy and Space Science, let's say. They are already covered at the, these two, in these two strategic documents. Now, when comes the time to implement, you have to look at the resources you have and the opportunities also you have to save. We were working on the governance, which is the African Space Agency. It takes time. And I want people also to not to think that African Union Commission, we have a lot of resources. No. This, uh, and uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Mahama is uh, online here, Marsh also online, and even uh, uh, Pro Pro Dr. Abiodun and uh, Professor Va. They know the resources African Union Commission has. Therefore, we need, with the small resources we have, we need to strategize in such a way we have a huge impact. Therefore, working on the governance. Secondly, working with EO. We want it, we don't want it. Earth observation is the first space segment in the continent well known. The others are there, they are known, but they don't have the same in terms of number of people being involved. Earth observation was a kind of tool for us to demonstrate to what extent space can contribute to address the policy makers or the decision makers priorities. Thanks God, with the partnership with the European Union, we had GMS in Africa, which is for us a kind of uh, demonstration project. It, it is a showcase project. Therefore, we are not focusing on earth observation only. We are using the less resources we have to make big impact, and we are also seizing the opportunity. Now, the African Space Agency is covering all the four segments. Let's give the chance to that space agency to be established and to look at how we can move forward in developing all the four segments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Otara. Uh, Dr. Musami, uh, you want to intervene now? Uh, and in addition, you may want to respond to one of the questions posed by one of the participants, uh, especially since you are very much uh, involved in the development of the African Space Policy and Strategy and the establishment of the African Space Agency. And he says, um, with the African Space Agency office set up in Egypt, is it possible to have hubs in 54 countries? And will they be focusing on capacity building programs and security of investment across Africa, especially in view of the free trade program, the continental free trade program that has been operationalized recently. Dr. Musami? 
Yeah, no, thanks, uh, Atom. Um, I just wanted to start off by responding to your question in terms of how do you make a severe GMS in Africa sustainable on the long term when the programs have ended. And I think the way to do that is to ensure that Africa puts its resources in some of these programs, but also ensuring that we build the human capital uh, because without that, none of these programs will be sustainable. So I think it's also important to embed human capital development within these programs as well. Sorry, yeah, there we go. Um, I think Danielle raised a, an important question is what is the unique contribution from the African continent? And I don't think, and uh, probably this is happening to some extent, uh, building a space program should never be a me too strategy. It should be based on what the user requirements are on the ground. And from that perspective, we need to also start engaging. You know, this is not a competitive race that we are engaging in on the African continent. So we have to try to find common footing and ground in terms of collaboration. We've seen some elements of that happening. And I think uh, Dr. Rabio is probably aware during the midst of COVID, there was a joint collaboration between NARSTA, Nigeria and South Africa at Sansa where we built a, an application for space weather, which is now part of the Space Weather Center, which was launched today by the president of South Africa. And that's a classic example of joint collaboration. And we need to see more of that happening. Um, so I think from that, you will find some unique contribution. And I think many of you probably know every launch that happens from the US is tracked here from Africa because the footprint is over Africa. So geographic advantage becomes quite key as well. And how do we build on that for serving the African continent? So there's some unique offerings that we have in the African continent, and we just need to exploit that and uh, move forward. Uh, from the, the the policy question that was all, all answered, or uh, sorry, asked, in terms of uh, having hubs on the African continent, I, I don't think it's practical to have 55 countries having their own space programs sort of divert. Okay. And I think one of the models that we looked at in the African space policy is to say, yeah, let's have at the continental level a sort of a, a coordinating body, which is the African Space Agency, and then also bootstrap whatever capabilities we have at the national level. But what we are also advocating for is for the five regional economic communities in Africa to have specific space focus areas. And we've seen that starting to happen in some of the RECs, the regional economic communities. I think in SEDEC, we started to develop a sub-regional space program within the SEDEC community. And that's probably going to be launched uh, in, in the near future. So that, I think, is probably the way to go, is um, the RECs having a, a regional focus that serves its user community as well. Um, yeah, so let me do that. Thanks, Adam. Okay, th thank you, Dr. Musami. Um, we we are running out of time, but I want to see whether we can still get um, maybe one or two questions from the audience. Um, there's a question here about um, policy. Um, what policy considerations would ease the development of African space companies and increase competitiveness? Uh, I don't know which of the panel members would like to respond to that. Uh, we talked earlier about... Um, yeah, I can take it, uh, uh, if you do okay. not mind. Yeah, please go on. Yeah, uh, I think uh, that is a very, very good... That is a very, very good question, I would say. Uh, it is an excellent question because uh, the innovation uh, comes in the space arena from two areas, the academia and also the researcher, the academia for training, research and development, and also from the private sector for the innovation. Now, for the private sector in Africa, and we made a study thanks to the support the African Union Commission gave to space in Africa through a contract to undertake uh, a kind of uh, inventory and to make a kind of analysis of the private sector in Africa. 
the report is fantastic and the findings from the report are excellent. What does it, what, what we are learning here? We are learning that the private sector in Africa is very weak and once created, most of them after six months disappear. Therefore, there is the question of sustainability. And space should not be seen aside or beside of the schema for each country to strengthen the industry. We see the incentive measures. It could be taxes, uh, facilities, uh, facilitation. It could be, I would say, uh, programs to support the companies. It could be, there are several, several, uh, 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 I would say, models. Now, for the space one, we need to work with the nations to encourage them to consider the private sector in the space arena as key part of the industry ecosystem in the country. Secondly, we need also to encourage our companies to propose services because that is the new approach currently. Instead of proposing data, instead of proposing product, the Africa ecosystem is very different. Most of the end users, they even don't need to know about the maps, like the example. They don't want to know about the infrastructure. What they are interested in is the data and the information, information, information to allow them to uh, 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 make sure that you know uh, they will continue with their own business. Therefore, there are several things we do. We have to do here. There is the policy uh, 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 component of the action. There is also what we call the programmatic component. The last one is to make sure that in each of our programs, and that is something we, are, we should encourage. Because in Africa, countries that are supposed to be in the space arena and ahead, they may have tough policy on data sharing. Without data, there is no private sector. The private sector can be in the uh, infrastructure hardware or what we call the the space segment or the ground segment, the downstream segment, we have to make sure that people have policies in place that can allow them to exchange and to add value without a lot of constraints. There are several things here we discussed during the Joe Week. I'm talking about the Joe Week because several things happened in Accra this week that are very interesting for uh, the space community in Africa. It is not only about EO, it is most of the time about the space in general. Let's talk about policy. Let's talk about incentive measures. Let's talk about regulations. And let's talk about strategic uh, uh, actions towards services development instead of being focused on research and development only. OK, thank you. Uh, very quickly, Dr. Musami, just very quickly. I, I saw your hand up. No, I put it down, but um, maybe okay. just to okay. a, a quick intervention. I, I think the probably the response to that question is, how does space agencies on the continent see their role? Uh, because sometimes agencies think that everything has to be done, done in-house. And that's not necessarily the model in which the world is going to, uh, towards. It has to look at an ecosystem, uh, its role from an ecosystem point of view, and how does it uh, you know, support and facilitate development of the industry as part of that model. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Musami. Uh, Dr. Abiodo, I see you on up, but just before you come in, uh, so that you just round up the program, I just want to pose just one final question to all the panelists, uh, and then Dr. Abiodo can come up. And the question is, um, next month, we African leaders, and maybe some of us here will be attending the US African Leaders Summit. What would be your central message? I mean, if you had the opportunity of addressing um, the summit, what would be your central message to the leaders, to the African leaders, to the uh, to the U.S. leaders, and of course, looking at the context of the U.S.-Africa partnership? So, um, so I don't know who wants to start first, Professor Rabiu, uh, or anybody, Professor Rabiu, or. Professor Wood, I think I saw your hand up. I'm happy to start. 
Uh, I've been thinking today about uh, there's a strong tradition, I think, within Africa of being a user and innovator in the areas of applications of authorization, communication, and positioning. And as humans more broadly are interacting with new activities in space, and we expect to see new questions to be answered, such as how do we live longer term in places like the moon, there are ways that we can already be asking how that kind of innovation feeds back into questions that are on Earth. The broader question of uh, how do we want to live in environments that face different challenges and access to resources. So I want to highlight the opportunities for innovation from Africa to ask influencing how uh, humans should and, and maybe should or should not do certain behaviors uh, beyond Earth. I think the lessons from Africa are really important and to guide even the ethics, but also the innovation for our next phase of human activity. And that will hopefully also transfer to benefits on Earth as well. Thank you, Professor Wood. Um, Ms. Grosia? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd say I, I, I think it's important to frame space as just another type of infrastructure. You know, so what do satellites do? They, they pull in information, they move information, they relay or broadcast it somewhere. So it's really interlinked with really our data infrastructure. So in some ways, I'd say there's a lot of existing tools and agreements that could just be leveraged uh, for the use of developing space capability. Um, and I'd also um, I'd also say that uh, we need to remember we have some common goals here, you know, space sustainability, uh, the effective use of this resource, um, the more countries that are involved and understand its value, you know, the better chance we have of keeping it a, a peaceful environment that is useful to all. So um, with those two, with those two pillars, I'll hand it off to the next speaker. Thank you, Ms. Grosia. Um, Professor Rabiu. Thank you very much, uh, her team. I uh, think, uh, well, the, the central message would be uh, one, uh, appreciation for what the U.S. has uh, stood for all the years, over the years. And then uh, there are models that work. And uh, I think it's been emphasized here uh, to consider having a kind of uh, uh, inf uh, interactions at the regional level, at the continental level, and at the national level. Uh, so this may also work out for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Rabiu. Um, Dr. Musami, final word for the summit. No, thanks, uh, Etim. I, I think we need to go with a different approach. It's not about looking for opportunities when we're engaging with the US. It's essentially taking what we have built here on the ground and putting that on the table. We planted the seed, essentially. But how do we nurture that seed and grow it? Um, the, you know, that seed that we planted. And so you've got to look at uh, potential areas of collaboration that helps us to expand on what we have already built. So I think that's probably the, the philosophical approach we should be adopting. And engaging in the summit. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Utara. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Etim. Uh, I would say the final message uh, I, I would suggest that we bring to the uh, uh, United States uh, is that Africa is the new Eldorado for space business. All the studies have demonstrated that. Why? There is a huge natural resources to manage, but most importantly, all is to be done in terms of infrastructure. Therefore, the United States would be invited to consider the capacity building as one of the key priority areas. Young people need to be trained. Secondly, it will be very interesting to consider harmonizing and integrating the different interventions of the United States in Africa, because it is scattered, complementary to some extent, but also uh, sometimes uh, they are duplicating. Let's work together to strengthen that relationship in the space arena for the African to take advantage of what United States can offer, but for Africa also to offer United States a place of doing business, because space is a business matter supporting humanitarian and others. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Dr. Otara. And um, apologies to our participants who have gone slightly over time, but um, we are rounding up now. Uh, I want to bring in uh, Dr. Abiodun, who is um, a co-founder of the African Space Leadership Institute, to um, give us some final reflections on the things that have been discussed and um, uh, some closing remarks. Dr. Abiodun, please. So, you're muted. You're muted, sir. Dr. Vyari, you're muted. Thank you. Uh oh, what happened? Right. Okay, uh, before, okay yeah, you know. before I round up, uh, inside me there's an agitation, and that agitation says, Why haven't we heard from Imram and uh, Temebi? Aganaba, as well as uh, Professor Baki. Uh, even if it's a sentence from each of them, I would like to hear for this meeting before before I make the closing remark from those three, because they are in the panel, they are in the audience right now. And I believe whatever they are going to say is very invaluable. So can we hear from them, any of the three, or all of the three, just one or two sentences? Baki. Imram. Imram. Thanks, Ade. Uh, I oh. think this was a very useful uh, engagement. And uh, I want to say that uh, we need to continue this conversation and uh, find uh, a framework of cooperation between the US and ourselves, very structured way of doing things so that uh, uh, together, I think there are synergies which we can um, develop and uh, be able to mutually benefit uh, from this kind of engagement. I think I want to rest my case there because uh, okay, thank uh, you. of time. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, again, uh, Tamiabi, are you there, please? Okay, Imram. Okay. In the absence of those two voices, um, let me do this. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I don't know where to begin because you've said a lot. Not that because you said a lot, but you've addressed many, many important issues. And, uh, and I want to thank my colleagues in the Institute for agreeing among ourselves to bring you on board to address this critical issue. Now, in doing the summary, I sort of felt I should take two approaches. The first approach is to quickly summarize what we have gone through so far today and finally to give my own views on behalf of Ashley at the end. And in so doing, uh, I want to begin with uh, the statement from Ambassador Giverty at the beginning. Uh, he addressed three issues that require our attention and that is getting involved with space because it is very useful for our security, it is needed for economic growth, and also for climate change. And he concluded by addressing the Artemis project uh, with the plan to start in South Africa shortly where they are going to do uh, a ground side breaking. Okay. And then we went further and uh, Professor Belo Sien, the commissioner from AU, represented by Mr. Micheni, he looked at everything about Agenda 2063 and uh, the African Space Program is 
a reflection of that particular agenda. And therefore, implementing the African space policy has become a critical issue. And to do so, one of the things the AU has done is to pursue the establishment of the African Space Agency, which uh, our colleague, Dr. Tidian, uh, clearly stated that it belongs to all of us in Africa to work and make it a very useful uh, organization. Okay? And, uh, and the Commissioner concluded that uh, there's a need for high-level engagement and dialogue between the U.S. and Africa in order to develop a roadmap and framework for Africa-USA space cooperation. And you, moderator Mr. Etienne, then you started by telling us that, um, and this was when you were introducing the panelists, you focus on what is going on in Africa to some extent, and, uh, and more importantly, with f emphasis on the U.S. African cooperation, by talking about the proposal from President Obama in 2014 and the three issues of uh, STEM, Pan-African Space University, Space and then Space Education and Outreach. And the question I have is, where are we in those areas today? And um, Dr. Otara continued with the proposal from the Commissioner by getting us to know that right now the AU is focused on the governance level in, in taking Africa forward in the area of space. That is, the African Space Agency, the African Space Program, and the fact that space is becoming a reality and, and it has to be an integration in Africa of not only the national efforts alone, but the national and regional. He spoke of the coordination of the continental uh, space program. And of course, accomplishing that is the job of his own unit. And our dear lady from MIT, Professor Wood, then took us through various areas of applications of space and her activities in Africa. <laughs> and um, Okay, I hope that echo is not coming from me. And it, she then went on to talk about the, the collaboration that is necessary uh, between the African countries and the establishments that she is working for and, uh, and some of the research activities that are going on. Uh, particularly, uh, she spoke about uh, in Angola, using uh, uh, remote sensing data for drought monitoring, deforestation in Ghana. And uh, she concluded by speaking uh, strongly about the need to prepare Africa in the area of space knowledge with emphasis on STEM. And um, uh, Professor Scott Space uh, look at the UN Sustainable Goals. And um, UN Sustainable Goals came out of uh, Unispace 3. Uh, part of it came out of that. And, uh, and I remember when I was still at the UN then as a staff. Uh, no, no, no. I came out of the UN after we were looking at, uh, that was in 2005, uh, the UN was looking at uh, Unispace 3 plus 5. And, uh, and we look at all the uh, agenda items that came out of that, and uh, I think there were 14 of them, and one of them was sustainable development. I was the chairman of that particular group, and I think I had about 15 or 20 countries that collaborated with me to develop a UN proposal for member states on how space can influence their sustainable development. Now, Professor Space also spoke about the role of the, of the private industry, uh, mentioned the 
program, uh, that is the Artemis program that the ambassador addressed, and also spoke about uh, astrobotics with about 250 students in Mexico, and whether Africa can take a look at this and see how beneficial it could be for Africa. Uh, then he focused on the need that we need to inspire students and to show them what is possible using space capabilities. And Professor Rabiu went ahead to itemize a number of space activities in Africa and uh, how the U.S. has been helpful or collaborative in some of these areas. But he quickly moved on uh, to be realistic and to be real by asking the African countries to look at their approaches to space uh, uh, to sp space exploration or s utilization of space data or to look at space program in general. And he particularly nailed it down by saying we need to put our house in order. And when I'm making my remarks, I will address that to the best of my own knowledge. Uh, and uh, what I'm, I'm in particular, he focused on the fact that African space activities, both nationally and continentally, need to be put in the right hands. And uh, for those of us from Africa, I think we understand what he meant. Okay? Then, and in so doing, he equally mentioned something that is very important, particularly in support of the meeting that is coming up between African and U.S. at the summit level, that is, the appropriate preparation of Africans who are going to that meeting in order to be effective. And, um, and then he concluded by talking about the equatorial projects and the program that he and other colleagues have with ICTP, and, and one of which is now being launched in Nigeria tomorrow. Okay, and uh, Ms. Rose Routier address space applications as a space changer. She reminded us, if we have forgotten, particularly in Africa, that free data is available if we will look for them. So that when we want to launch these satellites to acquire the same data that is already available, is that economically wise? Okay. He rem she reminded us also that we should look at ourselves, everything we do today, Space is part of it. Is it in our, in, in, in our security at home or our security within the country, our food production, our, our, our transportation systems? Basically, space is part of our lives today. And she concluded by looking at the need for us to focus on, the, on, on space as a global within the global ecosystems. And uh, Dr. Balman Sami finally brought everything to an end by reminding us that we should realize that our participation or our collaboration with the U.S. is based on the fact that the U.S. is an inspiration. And, uh, and if an African country can uh, demonstrate that particularly in the area of space, I think South Africa can do that, do that better than any. So then the question she then, he then asked is, where are we in Africa today? And how do we position ourselves within the space arena? And to do that, he requests us to look at the demand for space services in Africa. Those services are growing by leaps and bounds. He captured that by giving a number of statistics, particularly that the space market in Africa is about $4 billion plus every year, and, 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 and it is growing. So uh, even if that is growing, is that growing within because of the input of Africans or because of external input into African space activities? So uh, then... Uh, he spoke about the need for us in Africa 
to focus on what should be our priorities and including in particular technology transfer, technology development, and the building of needed local infrastructure. So basically, this is what I had, and I'm sure all of you had something similar and probably different, but generally I've tried to put in on, on, on paper, and I was writing at a super speed, so I, I couldn't put every word everybody said. But um, so that's my summary of what you did. And as I digest that, uh, I went back to look at my own personal interaction with the United States in the field of space. Or, or rather, rather an interaction with what I seem to know. And, and when I do this, I look at the fact that in the late 60s and the early 1970s, two or three African countries were contributing to space flight network monitoring by the United States when the United States was going around and then seeking support. Uh, we have one in Nigeria, one in Canary Islands as a monitoring station. I think there's one in um, Mombasa. And as, um, so all of this was going on. Then in 1972, the U.S. launched Landsat. And also the U.S. went around Africa and the African countries, showed them some of the data. And when the just, just before the satellite was launched, there was a, a sort of simulation. And at the end of that simulation, the satellite itself was launched. And in Nigeria, I was a member of the faculty at the University of Ife at, at that time, and now it's called Abafemi Awolo University. Uh, we at that university, about now of us, the Vice Chancellor Professor Lua Sami put us together and asked us to write a proposal for Nigeria to submit to NASA through the U.S. Embassy in Lagos so that the U.S. could monitor the data of Nigeria from for monitor from space and the US did and gave us that data and that type of support was not limited to Nigeria other African countries had the same experience so my question is what did we do with those data in Nigeria and in other African countries okay so that's a question I'm not the one to answer because I was not in Nigeria then I left Nigeria after that, after that submission. But what have we done? Then finally, the U.S. came up in the mid-1960s with the establishment of Intelsat, which was more or less an intergovernmental organization when it first started. And that enabled many African countries to buy shares in Intelsat. And uh, it provided communication uh, infrastructure for basically for the whole world but time as time went on Intelsat faced so much competition that's what it said and therefore they sold the company to a private conglomerate so where did that leave Africa many African countries felt that they didn't have any control over their communication infrastructure so a few of them then went ahead and started buying communication satellites. Okay, uh, I know in my own country, Nigeria, uh, has acquired two Angola, some I think uh, uh, Egypt. Uh, I'm not sure. I think South Africa is planning to do a similar thing. Uh, then towards the end of the uh, before 2000, then African countries started thinking about going into space seriously, uh, and I think uh, Unispace 3 may have influenced it to some extent. Uh, but the question is in going to space, what do you want to do? So they started establishing space agencies. Uh, I was consulted. 
as to the naming of such an institution, uh, particularly in my own country, Nigeria. Um, my recommendation in 1998, to be exact, was this. When you go into the world and you say you are a space agency, you are telling the world that from letter A to letter Z or Z, you have everything to provide. You have all the knowledge of space from letter A to Z. Do you? But if you do what the Indians did, they established an Indian Space Research Institute or Indian Space Research, Indian Space Research Organization is an institute, yeah, ISRO. If, it's, if you have something like that, you have, you don't have the pressure of the world over you to say, where, 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 you say you are an agency, show us your results, show, why are you making this mistake, why are you not, but with, as an institute, you have the liberty to make mistakes, to learn, to do everything, and people ask for your results, you tell them you are not ready, when you are ready, you let them know what you are doing. You have the opportunity to develop at your own pace. Secondly, in the pursuit of these satellites, when you look at, as we are speaking right now, there are over 50 foreign satellites in the field of communication that are serving Africa non-stop, 24 hours a day. What is the capability of an African communication satellite and how can it compete with all these 50 companies that have been in business over 30 or 40 years before you started? And many of you are with one satellite. So how can a customer depend on you, the owner of one satellite? What happens if that one satellite fails? Anyway, in the meantime, the rest of the world is going on with its own activities in space, development and utilization. So going forward, uh, I, I, I look at, we, we spoke at this meeting at a, a, about a lot of research and so on and so forth. And that is just, uh, there are many things that I want to say, but I can't say everything. So I just want to focus on this research aspect. Because if we are going to participate either in the, in, the, in the lunar project or as some African countries have indicated, they wanted to participate even in the ISS project. What are you going to do there? When I was at the UN, or even after I left, uh, the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs was requesting an invitation to participate in ISS, come up with a research project. So I'm suggesting that when you do that, what is your research focus? How significant is this research work for your country? What are the outcomes you expect from this research? What is the relationship between the research activity and other activities in your country? And what are the social and economic impacts? How will this research advance theoretical and practical knowledge in your institutions? And what are the risks and how are you going to mitigate them? And who is going to pay for this? So going forward, let us look at the following and then I'll conclude. One, if we are going to further our relationship with the United States, and we call it for the purpose of this meeting, Africa-US space partnership, what should African countries look for from the United States? And my first thing is, please don't look, ask for money. The U.S. has its own national priorities. I'm living in the United States, I know that. 
And there is what we call donor fatigue. When I was in Nigeria as the advisor to President Obasanjo, uh, not at, uh, on space science and technology, and the urge within the administration was that we should approach the United States and the other countries to support us in this way and that way. I put in writing a statement, please do not ask any country to support you financially for this project. The capability and the knowledge you are going to gain by going into space will enable you to develop infrastructures and programs that are going to compete with theirs. Do you then expect them to fund their competitor and grant it the ability to compete with them? That is not real. Then, secondly, the U.S. is not coming to Africa to be building the infrastructure. Africa needs to build its own infrastructure. Apart from that, that is not a business of U.S. government. At best, the U.S. government can help you identify local companies or local uh, or private companies that can advise you on how to design and build your, build your projects. But, and this is also based on competitive bidding in this country. What we should be, our, what therefore, what should be our focus on this space relationship we are talking about? And all of you have addressed it. And that is research, education, and training support based on STEM and based on collaboration among African countries. Dr. Biodu, uh, sorry, sir, we've gone, we've gone. Uh, let me, let, uh, let me conclude. I need, I need, I need, I need two more minutes, please, or two more minutes. I need to conclude. Don't close me down. So, what are the preparatory steps we need to take to address our needs locally? Uh, we must recognize that the space age of today, in the space age of today, African countries that are able to help themselves, that invest in the generation of knowledge, and can contribute to innovation, will be enthusiastically welcomed at the, and will, have, will interact at the research and development levels with other countries, including the United States. That should be our focus. So the subject is, when you want to collaborate, collaboration requires the principle of give and take. So what are you giving or what are you taking? And if you cannot have anything to share, you cannot be on the table. So we need to do better than we have done. Uh, in India, that is what they are doing, and, and I, I plead with us not only to collaborate with the United States, but to take examples in India where they are using space in, to do everything on a daily basis. So finally, if we follow all that has been said at this meeting, the following will happen in Africa. If we have a multiplying effect on our economy and industrial production, it will enhance our life, uh, the quality of African lives. It will enhance the science and technology capability of Africa. And it will reduce African dependence on scientific and technological ideas. It will strengthen the meaning of and give substance to technological collaboration and knowledge sharing between Africa and the United States and other countries. So, my dear brothers and sisters on this panel and, 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 and guests, following this way, we should be able to uplift the image of Africa at home and abroad if we follow some of the things you have recommended at this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Abiodun, um, and thank you to all the participants. Uh, sincere apologies for going overboard. Uh, Dr. Abiodi is our father and uh, in our culture in Africa, you have to listen to the elders 
when you are speaking. So, <laughs> but so thank you, sir, for the message. Uh, so we will have to stop here. I noted some more comments that came up in the chat, but I think many of these things will bring up um, in future roundtables. Uh, like the, talking about the Pan-African University Space Science Institute and uh, engaging more youth uh, in space activities. Uh, so for now, we'll have to stop at this point. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to our ambassadors. Thank you to the panelists, every single person and um, every participant. Um, we look forward to seeing you more in our future programs. And um, uh, Let's keep the engagement uh, going in other platforms. Thank you, everyone, and have a good day. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Danny, Professor Wood. Thank you, Ms. Kosia. Thank you, everyone.